flying all around me. The man standing next to me was shot by my side. His blood spotted upon my clothes, which I wore for weeks. My nearest blood, except that which runs in my veins, was shed for liberty. Liberty is dear to my heart. I cannot endure the thought that my countrymen should be slaves. Revolutionary War veteran, Samuel Harris. Hello, I'm Colin Powell, and I was an American soldier for 35 years. I was a black American soldier, and I followed in a long tradition of black men and women who have served this nation since long before our Revolutionary War. For so many years, they served their nation without their nation ever serving them. They served because they believed in this nation. They believed in the promise of our democracy. They believed in what the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution said. But for so many years, they were denied the rights and the privileges that other Americans enjoyed. Their story isn't well known. Their story was suppressed. Historians did not write about it well enough. But there's a wonderful story. It is the story of a group of Americans who never lost their love of this country, never lost their faith in what the Founding Fathers I promise. And that's why this story is simply called For Love and Liberty. This nation's African-American servicemen and women is a heroic story draped in irony. Why, despite enormous injustice, did these determined individuals fight so valiantly for freedoms they themselves did not enjoy? The answer to this question can be found in the letters, diaries, thoughts, and reflections of those who were there. Their words are relevant to every American speak of courage, honor, duty, and sacrifice for love of liberty. I'm Halle Berry, and this is their story. Five years before the American Revolution, on March 5th, 1770, Angry Boston citizens confronted British soldiers who had been sent to enforce English tax laws. A black man shouted, be not afraid, and led the protesters into the fray. The redcoats raised their weapons and fired. In that one volley, Crispus Attucks, an escaped slave, became the first man to die for a cause that would become the War for Independence. Who set the example of guns? Who taught the British soldier that he might be defeated? Who dared look into his eyes? I place, therefore, this Crispus Attox in the foremost rank of the men that dared. John Hancock. When Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death, Negroes accounted for nearly 20% of America's population. Most were slaves. 
I was born on the eastern shore of Maryland in the year of our Lord, 1753, in a state of slavery, and belonged to Francis de Shields. He was a colonel in Washington's army. I was with him through the whole course of the Revolutionary War. There, human blood ran down in torrents till the waters of the river were red as crimson. Revolutionary War veteran James Roberts. In the spring of 1775, England sent a detachment of 700 men to Concord, Massachusetts to destroy the colony's military supplies. Paul Revere passed the word that British regulars were coming and Minutemen, both black and white, were waiting for them at Lexington. Prince Esterbrook was among those patriots who were wounded. He was a slave. At Lexington they did appear, arrayed in hostile form. And though our friends were peaceful there, yet on them fell the storm. Thrice happy they who thus resign into the peaceful grave, much better there in death confined than a surviving slave. Poet, soldier, preacher, Lemuel Haynes. Two months later, the British once again took the offensive. Free men of color were among the patriots gathered at Bunker Hill to stop them. England would eventually win the day, but not before the militiamen, despite being badly outnumbered, inflicted devastating losses. Eyewitness accounts of that day are contradictory, but in 1818, historian and author Samuel Sweat would write, among those who mounted the works was the gallant Major Pitcairn, who exultingly cried out, the day is ours, when a black soldier named Salem shot him through and he fell. Writer Samuel Sweat. George Washington took command of the Continental Army two weeks later and promptly called for volunteers. Black men, however, were specifically forbidden from enlisting. Neither Negroes, boys unable to bear arms, nor old men unfit to endure the fatigue of the campaign are to be enlisted. General George Washington. Among the assumptions were that blacks were too cowardly to fight, that armed slaves would be a danger to their masters, and if they fought, then they must be freed. Still others believed their service to be undignified and beneath the great principles of the revolution. Is it consistent with the sons of freedom to trust their all to be defended by slaves? General Philip Schuyler, Continental Army. Not all the founding fathers agreed with those sentiments. John Adams noted in his diary, They say if 1,000 regular British troops should land in Georgia and their commander provided them with arms and clothes and proclaimed freedom, 20,000 Negroes would join from Georgia and South Carolina in a fortnight. John Adams. The English came to the same conclusion, and Lord Dunmore, the British governor of Virginia, issued a proclamation inviting slaves to join the royal forces. I do hereby declare all Negroes free that are willing to bear arms, for the more speedily reducing the colony to a proper sense of their duty to his majesty's crown and dignity. Lord Dunmore. Despite the many obvious reasons to serve under the British, the Negro's primary loyalty was to the principle of liberty. A slave poet named Phyllis Wheatley expressed those sentiments in a letter which was published in the Connecticut Gazette in 1774. In every human breast, God has implanted a principle which we call love of freedom. It is impatient of oppression and pants for deliverance. Poet, Phyllis Wheatley. Alexander Hamilton held, such beliefs went to the heart of the revolution and pressed the Continental Congress to allow black men to enlist. I have not the least doubt that Negroes will make very excellent soldiers. An essential part of the plan is to give them their freedom with their muskets. 
This will secure their fidelity and animate their courage by opening the door to their emancipation. Alexander Hamilton. Desperate for soldiers, General Washington agreed. As the general is informed that numbers of free Negroes are desirous of enlisting, he gives leave to the recruiting officers to entertain them and promises to lay the matter before Congress, who, he doubts not, will approve it. General George Washington. During the long and bitter fight that was the American Revolution, five all-black units would shed their blood, the most famous being the 130-some men of the 1st Rhode Island Regiment. They received their baptism by fire at the Battle of Rhode Island. Samuel Harris was among them. The regiment to which I belong was ordered to what was called a flanking position. It was opposed to them in a danger. They attacked us with great fury, but were repulsed. Again, they reinforced and attacked us again with more vigor and determination, and again were repulsed. Again, they reinforced and attacked us the third time with the most desperate courage and resolution, but a third time were repulsed. The contest was fearful. Our position was hotly disputed and as hotly maintained. First Rhode Island veteran, Dr. Samuel Harris. Slaves served the cause of liberty behind the lines as well. In 1781, the Continental Army, assisted by a French officer, the Marquis de Lafayette, was preparing to fight a decisive battle. The British commander, General Cornwallis, believed he would be victorious. What he didn't know was that in his dining room, mingling amongst his officers, was a black servant named James, who also happened to be an American spy. His information helped the colonists defeat England at the Battle of Yorktown. Lafayette would later write, This Negro spy properly acquitted himself with some important communications I gave him. His intelligence from the enemy's camp were industriously collected and more faithfully delivered. Marquis de Lafayette. After eight long years of war, America had won its freedom. The ideals of the revolution were permanently enshrined in a national motto, E Pluribus Unum, out of many, one for some that included blacks. Holding fellow men in bondage and slavery is repugnant to the golden law of God and the inalienable right of mankind, as well as every principle of the late glorious revolution. Maryland plantation owner, Philip Graham. Southern political leaders disagreed and in 1787 made their views known at Philadelphia's Constitutional Convention. Religion and humanity have nothing to do with this question. The true question at present is whether the southern states shall or shall not be parties to the Union. If the northern states consult their interest, they will not oppose the increase of slaves, which will increase the commodities of which they will become the carriers. Constitutional Convention Delegate John Rutledge. The argument prevailed. When we, the people of the United States, finally ratified the Constitution, it promised to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, yet did nothing to eliminate slavery in the South. Some black veterans were reclaimed by their former masters as property. James Roberts was one of them. Honor, justice, and the hope of being set free with my wife and four little ones prompted me to return home. I was soon after separated from my wife and children and sold for $1,500. And now will commence the statement of my wages for all my fighting and suffering in the Revolutionary War for the liberty of this ungrateful, illiberal country to me and my race. Revolutionary War veteran James Roberts. In 1794, Eli Whitney unveiled his cotton gin. 
Within three generations, America's slave population would grow from 700,000 to 4 million. I would never have drawn my sword in the cause of America if I could have conceived that thereby I was helping to found a nation of slaves. Marquis de Lafayette. The Second War of American Independence was declared on Great Britain in June of 1812. It was fought over freedom of the seas and national pride. As in the Revolution, the fear of arming large numbers of black men prevented most African Americans from serving in the United States Army. The Navy, however, was a different story. I have never had any better fighters than those niggers. They stripped to the waist and fought like devils, sir, seeming to be utterly insensible to danger and to be possessed with the determination to outfight white sailors. Captain Isaac Hull, Commander, USS Constitution. During the War of 1812, roughly 10% of all the men who put to sea were black. I think it is the duty of every man to stand in defense of his country, whether black or white. Seaman Augustus Thomas. Nathaniel Shaler, captain of the Governor Tompkins, articulated their heroism best when he wrote of his battle with three British warships. Her first broadside killed two men and wounded others. The name of one of my poor fellows who was killed ought to be registered in the Book of Fame and remembered with reverence as long as bravery is considered a virtue. He was a black man by the name of John Johnson. A 24-pound shot struck him in the hip and took away all the lower part of his body. In this state, the poor brave fellow lay on the deck and several times exclaimed to his shipmates, fire away, my boys. No haul a color down. The other, also a black man by the name of John Davis, was struck in much the same way. He fell near me and several times requested to be thrown overboard, saying he was only in the way of the others. While America has such tars, she has little to fear from the tyrants of the sea. The idea that America held slaves was an irony not lost upon the British. As they had during the Revolution, the English made an effort to recruit African Americans. An eyewitness whose name history records as the old sub was there. A great number of Negroes, delighted at the unhoped for freedom our expedition had placed within their reach, were of course received on board the fleet. Perfect freedom, that freedom which the vaunted land of liberty denied them, was guaranteed to all. Some 200 of these black marines were part of the British advance that eventually captured the federal city. At just about three, James Smith, a free man of color, galloped up to the White House, waving his hat and cried out, clear out, clear out. All then was confusion. White House slave, Paul Jennings. The British chased First Lady Dolly Madison from the residence, then burned the place down. The troops advanced forthwith into town, where they proceeded without a moment's delay to burn and destroy everything connected with government. Of the Senate House, the President's Palace, and the dockyards, nothing could be seen except heaps of smoking ruins. British soldier, George Gellick. Four months later, General Andrew Jackson's army was facing defeat in Louisiana. The British were about to attack New Orleans, and the Americans were ill-prepared to stop them. Desperate times call for desperate measures. I call on free men of color to rally round the standard of the eagle. 
to defend all which is dear in existence. As sons of freedom, you are now called upon to defend our most inestimable blessing, General Andrew Jackson. General Jackson also appealed to plantation owners for help. The wealthy land barons offered their slaves instead of their sons. If there are not enough blacks in place of my sons, go to the Springfield plantation and get as many more. If the Negro should get killed, they are paid for. But if my children should go and get killed, they cannot be replaced. Plantation owner, Calvin Smith. Jackson then promised the slaves their freedom. If you will go, and the battle is fought and the victory gained on Israel's side, you shall be free. James Roberts, the Revolutionary War veteran who had been sold back into slavery, heard Jackson's speech. Years later, he recalled the events of that day in one of the first slave narratives. Hardships of whatever kind or however severe vanished into vapor at the sound of freedom. James Roberts. The slaves joined some 4,000 other American soldiers, including the 1st and 2nd Battalions of free men of color. The men outnumbered two to one, faced off against 8,000 battle-tested British troops. The fight was brief, but deadly. We fell them like grass before the scythe. Platoon after platoon lay like scattered hail upon the ground. James Roberts. When it was over, the British had lost nearly 2,000 men, including their leader, General Packingham. History records that Andrew Jackson wrote a letter to Secretary of War, James Monroe. I have always believed that General Packingham fell from the bullet of a free man of color. A few days later, his headquarters issued a general order, which read, The two corps of colored volunteers have not disappointed the hopes that were formed of their courage and perseverance in the performance of their duty. General Andrew Jackson. Louisiana's freemen of color were given a parade through New Orleans and then mustered out of the service. They received the same pay and bounty as their white counterparts, but promises of federal pensions and land grants were never honored. Of those men still considered slaves, many were simply returned to their owners. When James Roberts protested, he was threatened with death. Now just think of that. Two days before, I had, with my fellow soldiers, saved their city from fire and massacre, and their wives and children from blood and burning. Now they want me shot simply for contending for my freedom, which both my master and Jackson had solemnly before high heaven promised before I left home. General Jackson, who had his eye on the presidency, did nothing. Such monstrous deception and villainy could not be allowed to disgrace the pages of history and blacken the character of a man who wanted the applause and approbation of his country. James Roberts. In the North, America's abolitionists began to speak out. Black veterans of the revolution, including Dr. Samuel Harris, were among them. It surprises me that every man does not rally at the sound of liberty and array himself with those who are laboring to abolish slavery in our country. The very mention of it warms the blood in my veins and old as I am, makes me feel something of the spirit and impulses of 76. Then liberty meant something, then liberty Independence, freedom were in every man's mouth. They were the sounds at which they rallied and under which they fought and bled. The word slavery then filled their hearts with horror. They fought because they would not be slaves. Those whom liberty has cost nothing do not know how to prize it. Revolutionary War veteran, 
Dr. Samuel Harris. The black community found a common voice in orator Frederick Douglass. In 1852, free blacks and abolitionists alike refused to celebrate Independence Day. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. Frederick Douglass. Race was tearing the nation apart, and a young lawyer from Illinois was determined to stop it. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. President Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was elected president on November 6, 1860. Less than two months later, South Carolina, unable to accept an administration whose opinions and purposes were hostile to slavery, seceded from the Union. Within five months, 10 other states had joined them, and the stage was set for the American Civil War. The Negro is not equal to the white man. Slavery is his natural and normal condition. The new Confederate government is the first in the history of the world to be based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. Confederate States of America Vice President Alexander Stevens. The first shot in the war between the states was fired by Confederate troops in Charleston, South Carolina on April 12, 1861. The next day, the Union Army surrendered Fort Sumter. In Boston, a group of black citizens passed a resolution pleading for an opportunity to serve the cause of liberty. Our feelings urge us to say to our countrymen that we are ready to stand by and defend the government as the equals of its white defenders. To do so with our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor for the sake of freedom we ask you to modify your laws that we may enlist, that full scope be given to the patriotic feelings burning in the colored man's breast. The North, however, believed the war would end quickly and saw no need for black soldiers. President Lincoln rationalized, to arm the Negroes would turn 50,000 bayonets from the loyal border states against us. Union General William Tecumseh Sherman didn't want them either. The Negro is in a transition state and is not the equal of the white man. Newspapers like the Milwaukee Sentinel thought their service undignified. Certainly we hope we may never have to confess to the world that the United States government has to seek an ally in the Negro to regain its authority. Milwaukee Sentinel. While officially prohibited from serving in the army, many northern freemen of color fought anyway. William Henry Johnson was one such man. In a letter to a Boston newspaper, he wrote of his participation in the first major fight of the war, the Battle of Bull Run and the Union Army's subsequent defeat. We lost everything. Life, ammunition, and honor. We were driven like so many sheep into Washington, disgraced and humiliated. William Henry Johnson, Manassas, Virginia, July 24, 1861. 
Northern confidence was shaken, and President Lincoln issued a call for black volunteers to join the Union cause as laborers, longshoremen, servants, and cooks, but specifically not as soldiers. Boston abolitionist Frederick Douglass demanded more. Once, let the black man get upon his person the brass letters U.S. Let him get an eagle on his buttons, a musket on his shoulder, and bullets in his pocket, and there is no power on earth which can deny that he has earned the right to citizenship in the United States. Frederick Douglass. Early in the war, the Union Navy had blockaded Charleston in an effort to isolate Fort Sumter. Inside the harbor, a slave named Robert Smalls was forced to serve as wheelman aboard the Confederate gunboat Planter. I often talked with other black sailors on board the Planter about the possibility of our stealing the ship and delivering it to the Union forces. Our chance came when all the white members of the ship's crew went to town, leaving me and seven other black sailors on board. At 3 a.m., we began our journey along the heavily guarded coast. We hoisted the ship's Confederate flag, giving the appropriate whistle signal as we passed Fort Sumter. I wore the captain's hat and imitated his walk. As we approached the fleet of Union ships, we raised a white sheet, signaling surrender. Robert Smalls. Robert Smalls' heroic feat was heralded in newspapers throughout the North. From the New York Tribune, if we must remember with humility that the Confederate flag yet waves where our national colors were first struck, we should be all the more prompt to recognize the merit that has put into our possession the first trophy from Fort Sumter. Four months later, President Lincoln announced that effective January 1st, 1863, all slaves held in rebel states would be considered free by the American government. This was the Emancipation Proclamation. I do order and declare that all persons held as slaves henceforward shall be free and that the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authorities thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of said persons. The proclamation also permitted African Americans to serve in the military. I further declare that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed services of the United States to garrison forts, positions, stations, and to man vessels of all sorts in said service. President Abraham Lincoln. Frederick Douglass seized the opportunity to demonstrate once and for all the black man's commitment to the principles of liberty. Men of color, to arms. We can get at the throat of treason through the state of Massachusetts. She was first in the war of independence, first to break the chains of her slaves first to make the black man equal before the law, first to admit colored children to her common schools. She was first to answer with her blood the alarm cry of the nation when its capital was menaced by the rebels. Massachusetts now welcomes you as her soldiers. Frederick Douglass. In New Orleans, Major General Benjamin Franklin Butler began mustering freemen of color into the Union Army. Once assembled, the Louisiana Native Guard was pressed into service. Their captain, Andre Cayou, called himself the blackest man in town. When General Butler sent for the soldiers, a regimental spokesman whose name has been lost to time told the officer, General, we come from a fighting race. The only cowardly blood we have in our veins is the white blood. The men were put to the test at Port Hudson, a highly fortified Confederate camp overlooking the Mississippi River in Louisiana. The fight was one of the bloodiest battles in the entire Civil War. Six times with desperate valor, 
they charged over ground where success was hopeless. Six times they went to useless death, swept back by the blazing breath of shot and shell before which nothing living could stand. Here fell the gallant Captain Kayu, black as the ace of spades, refusing to leave the field though his arm had been shattered by a bullet. He returned to the charge until killed by a shell. Sergeant Major Christian Fleetwood. After 48 days, Confederate troops finally surrendered. Black soldiers had proven their worth in the field of honor. The bones of the black man are at the present time whitening in the battlefields, while their blood, simultaneously with the white man's, oozes into the soil of his former homes. I hope that the day is not far distant when we shall see the colored man enjoying the same rights and privileges as those of the white man of this country. Sergeant Thomas B. Wester. Six days earlier, rebel forces had also been defeated at Gettysburg, and the high tide of the Confederacy began to recede. In South Carolina, the rebel fortification Battery Wagner was Charleston Harbor's first line of defense. The Union Army considered its capture to be essential, and the all-black Massachusetts 54th led the attack to bring it down. My dear wife, we are on the march to Fort Wagner to storm it. We have just completed a successful retreat from James Island. We fought a desperate battle there Thursday morning. God has protected me through this. My first fiery, let it trial, and I do give him the glory. First Sergeant Robert Simmons, Massachusetts 54th. Fort Wagner was located on a barrier island. The earthen installation was defended by 1,700 Confederate troops. When the attack came, some 600 men of the Massachusetts 54th marched across an open beach. The Union soldiers were cut down by a devastating torrent of gunfire. Sergeant Major Lewis Douglas, son of Frederick Douglas, wrote of the slaughter in a letter to his fiancée. It was terrible. The shell would explode and clear a space of 20 feet. Our men would close up again, but it was no use. How I got out of that fight alive, I cannot tell. But I am here. Remember, if I die, I die in a good cause. Sergeant Major Lewis Douglas. 272 members of the 54th were either killed or wounded in the attack. The unit's commanding officer, 25-year-old Colonel Robert Shaw, was one of those who lost his life. We were exposed to a murderous fire from the battery of the fort. Mortal men could not stand such a fire. When the men saw their gallant leader fall, they made a desperate effort to get him out. They were shot down or reeled in the ditch below. Corporal James Gooding. When the color bearer was wounded, Private William Carney raced forward to rescue the American flag. As the former slave fought his way back to the Union lines, he was shot in the head, chest, right arm, and both legs. Despite his wounds, the 23-year-old soldier staggered into camp, clutching the bloody flag. The surviving comrades broke into cheers as William Carney proudly exclaimed, Boys, I did my duty. The dear old flag never touched the ground. Private William Carney. For his actions that day, William Carney was awarded the Medal of Honor. I decided I could best serve my God by serving my country and my oppressed brothers. Private William Carney. The 54th served with distinction throughout the war. Following a desperate battle at Olisty, Florida, their heroism was documented by an aide to Union General Truman Seymour, who wrote, Had it not been for the glorious 54th Massachusetts, the whole brigade would have been captured or annihilated. They would not retreat when ordered, but charged on with the most fearful desperation. If this regiment is not one glory enough to have shoulder straps, where is there one that ever did? By 
August of 1863, 14 Negro regiments were in the fight. As witnessed by a soldier's letter to his wife, all had but one thing on their minds. Dear wife, though great are the present difficulties, I look forward to a brighter day when I shall have the opportunity of seeing you in the full enjoyment of freedom. I would like to know if you are still in slavery. If you are, it will not be long before we shall have crushed the system that now oppresses you, for in the course of three months, you shall have your liberty. Samuel Campbell. For the wives of many of the soldiers, their husband's service was often just one more burden they were forced to bear. My dear husband, I have received your last kind letter a few days ago and was much pleased to hear from you once more. It seems like a long time since you left me. The children talk about you all the time. I wish you could get a furlough and come to see us once more. Remember all I told you about how they would do me after you left? For they do worse than they ever did, and I do not know what will become of me and my poor little children. Write to me, and do not forget me. Farewell, my dear husband, from your wife, Martha. Despite their heroics, the United States government was paying its black soldiers less than its white troops. Members of the 3rd South Carolina Volunteers, led by 23-year-old Sergeant William Walker, objected. He was promptly charged with mutiny, arrested, placed before a firing squad, and executed. Months earlier, Massachusetts 54th veteran Corporal James Gooding had appealed to President Lincoln for equality. When the war trumpet sounded over the land, when men knew not the friend, from the traitor. The black man laid his life at the altar of the nation, and he was refused. When the arms of the Union were beaten, again the black man made the privilege of aiding his country in her need to be again refused. And now he is in the war. And how has he conducted himself? Let the rich mold around Fort Wagner's parapets be upturned, and there will be found an eloquent answer. Now, Your Excellency, we have done a soldier's duty. Why can't we have a soldier's pay? Corporal James Goody. Corporal John Payne wanted even more. I am not willing to fight for this government for money alone. Give me my rights, the rights that this government owes me, the same rights that the white man has. I would be willing to fight three years for this government without one cent of the mighty dollar. Liberty is what I'm struggling for, and what pulse does not beat high at the very mention of the name? Corporal John Payne. Harriet Tubman was the best-known conductor on Antebellum America's Underground Railroad. During the Civil War, she supported the North as a spy, scout, and guerrilla leader. In June of 1863, the 52-year-old woman led 300 black soldiers in a raid that destroyed millions of dollars worth of rebel supplies and rescued nearly 800 slaves without losing a single man. Lincoln's gunboats had come to set them free. They swarmed to the protection of the old flag. Some had bags on their backs with pigs in them. One woman had a pail on her head, rice was smoking in it just as she'd taken it from the fire. It was like children of Israel coming out of Egypt. Harriet Tubman. Drawing strength from the Union's march toward victory, a black soldier wrote to his daughters, still enslaved in Glasgow, Missouri, and assured them their moment of liberation was at hand. My dear children, I take my pen in hand to write you a few lines to let you know that I have not forgot you, and that I want to see you as bad as ever. Be assured that I will have you cost me my life. 
On the 28th of the month, 800 white and 800 black soldiers expects to start up the river. When they come, I expect to be with them and expect to get you both in return. Don't be uneasy, my children. I expect to have you. Spotswood Rice. In Tennessee, the Union Army held Fort Pillow. The compound was manned by 557 soldiers, half of whom were African Americans. On April 12, 1864, they were surrounded by 1,500 men of the Confederate cavalry. When the savage hand-to-hand -hand fighting was over, some 300 Union soldiers, most of them black, were dead. Nothing in the history of the rebellion has equaled in inhumanity and atrocity the horrid butchery at Fort Pillow. Abolitionist William Wells Brown. According to reports, the black soldiers were massacred after they had surrendered. The Confederate cavalry could be heard shouting, no quarter, no quarter, kill the damn niggers, shoot them down. After the battle, Confederate General Bedford Forrest was unrepentant. The river was dyed with the blood of the slaughtered for 200 yards. It is hoped that these facts will demonstrate to the Northern people that Negro soldiers cannot cope with Southerners. General Bedford Forrest. In 1864, Richmond, Virginia was one of the most heavily fortified cities in America. The stronghold was the capital of the Confederacy and defended by the rebels' most capable officer, General Robert E. Lee. Abraham Lincoln ordered the city captured, and it took General Ulysses S. Grant 10 months to do it. Here was war indeed. Upon its grandest scale and in all its infinite variety, the tireless march under the burning sun, chilling frosts and driven tempests, the rush and roar of the man charge, with disease adding its horrors to the decimation of shot and shell. Here, the Negro stood in the full glare of the greatest searchlight, part and parcel of the grandest armies ever mustered upon this continent, competing side by side with the best and bravest of the Union Army against the flower of the Confederacy. Sergeant Major Christian Friedman. For the United States colored troops, the siege of Richmond came to a head at the Battle of New Market Heights. There, on the morning of September 29th, black soldiers from General Benjamin Butler's Army of the James led the attack. Their battle cry was, remember Fort Pillow. They were decimated as waiting Confederates poured out of earthen trenches to kill hundreds in hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was a deadly hailstorm of bullets, sweeping men down as hailstones sweep the leaves from trees. We struggled through the two lines, but it was sheer madness, and those of us who were able had to get out as best we could. I have never been able to understand how I lived under such a hail of bullets. Sergeant Major Christian Fleetwood. In 80 minutes of fighting, Black troops suffered terrible losses. But when the shooting stopped, New Market Heights belonged to the Union Army. As I rode along this line of charge, there lay in my path the dead and wounded of my colored comrades. I felt in my heart that the capacity of the Negro race for soldiers had then and there been fully settled forever. A few more such gallant charges, and to command colored troops will be the post of honor in the American armies. Major General Benjamin Butler. Later that day, nine officers and 189 men of the 7th United States Colored Troops stormed nearby Fort Gilmer. All but one were killed, wounded, 
for capture. Their commanding officer, Captain Julius A. Weiss, would later say, It was a time for manly tears. Fourteen black soldiers were awarded the Medal of Honor for their heroism at Newmarket Heights, including Christian Fleetwood. Never again while time lasts will the doubt arise as in 1861. Will the Negro fight? As a problem, it has been solved. As a question, it has been answered. And as a fact, it is as established as the eternal hills. Sergeant Major Christian Fleetwood. When Richmond finally fell on April 3rd, 1865, the black 5th Massachusetts Cavalry were among the first to march through town. My regiment was among the first that entered that city. A vast multitude assembled on Broad Street. And I was aroused amidst the shouts of 10,000 voices and proclaimed for the first time in that city freedom to all mankind. After which the doors of all the slave pens were thrown open and thousands came out shouting and praising God and Master A. I could not express the joy I felt, but suffice to say that God is on the side of the righteous and will in due time reward them. Chaplain Garland H. White. The next day, Abraham Lincoln arrived in Richmond. Garland White accompanied him. We made a grand parade through most of the principal streets, and it appeared to me that all of the colored people in the world had collected in that city for that purpose. Women and children of all sizes running after Master Abraham. Chaplain Garland H. White. As the president toured the city, a group of freed slaves fell to their knees before him and cried out, Glory, hallelujah. Do not kneel to me. You must kneel to God only and thank him for your freedom. Liberty is your birthright. God gave it to you as he gave it to others. And it is a sin that you have been deprived of it for so many years. President Abraham Lincoln. The Confederacy was dead. On April 15th, Abraham Lincoln was too. Furious because a Union victory meant nigger citizenship, John Wilkes Booth put him through. The nation was in shock. At his funeral, the Reverend Matthew Simpson echoed the thoughts of African Americans everywhere. Chieftain, farewell. The nation mourns thee. Hushed is thy voice, but its echoes of liberty are ringing through the world, and the sons of bondage listen with joy. We crown thee as our martyr, and humanity enthrones thee as her triumphant son. Reverend Matthew Simpson. Roughly 36,140 African Americans died in the service of the United States during the Civil War. 18 black soldiers and seven black sailors were recipients of the Medal of Honor. Tell me, tell me, weary soldier, from the rude and stirring wars, was my brother in the battle where you gained those noble scars? More than a decade later, in a speech given to Congress advocating civil rights for the Negro, Major General Benjamin Butler spoke of the sacrifices made by his African-American troops. There, in a space not wider than the clerk's desk, and 300 yards long, lay the dead bodies of 543 of my colored comrades slain in the defense of their country. Tell me, tell me, weary soldier, weary I swore to myself a solemn oath. Did he suffer with the wounded? 
May my right hand forget its cunning and my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. Tell me, tell me, weary soldier. If ever I fail to defend the rights of the men who have given their blood for me and my country, this day and for their race forever. Following the war, the only thing the South hated more than Yankees were blacks. President Andrew Johnson dispatched General Carl Schurz to investigate reports of racially motivated atrocities. His findings were shocking. Dead bodies of murdered Negroes were found on and near the highways and byways. Gruesome reports came from the hospitals, reports of colored men and women whose ears had been cut off, whose skulls had been broken by blows, whose bodies had been slashed by knives or lacerated with scourges. Men who are honorable in their dealings with their white neighbors will cheat a Negro without feeling a single tinge of honor. To kill a Negro, they do not deem murder. To debauch a Negro woman, they do not think fornication. To take property away from a Negro, they do not consider robbery. The people boast that when they get their freedmen's affairs into their own hands, to use their own expressions, quote, the niggers will catch hell, unquote. General Carl Shores. When President Johnson ignored the report, abolitionist Senator Charles Sumner and Congressman Thaddeus Stevens created the Joint Congressional Committee of 15, which reconstructed the South. The two men fought for and achieved the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which conferred citizenship on African Americans. Black men could now own property and soon after were entitled to vote. In the years that followed, 22 African Americans would serve in Congress, including Civil War hero Robert Smalls, who after capturing the rebel gunboat Planter, was made its captain, and who later became South Carolina's first black congressional representative. My race needs no special defense, for the past history of them in this country proves them to be the equal of any people anywhere. All they need is an equal chance in the battle of life. Congressman Robert Smalls. In 1866, Congress created six African-American army regiments. Among them was the 10th Cavalry. The men were assigned to the harshest, most desolate outpost in the Western frontier. Their mission was to make way for the Transcontinental Railroad by clearing the land of Mexican revolutionaries, outlaws, and American Indians. To the citizens of Las Vegas, Ladies and gents, as you all know, I left my home, my dear loving mother, sisters, and brothers, and friends, to come out here to this unknown country in defense of the stars and stripes, under which you people are now living in peace. I did not volunteer to come here to be called a brave kid, but because I thought it my duty to defend the stars and stripes of my country, even although it may cost me my life. Buffalo Soldier Simon Brown. When gold was discovered in California, white settlers began to stake claim to the entire continent. As the US Army moved into Native American territory, violence erupted. During the winter of 1866, Bands of Sioux warriors wiped out every man in two military detachments. In December, near Fort Carey, Wyoming, warriors annihilated Captain William Fetterman and his 80 men. The following June, near Fort Wallace, Kansas, circling vultures led Lieutenant Colonel Custer to 11 dead and mutilated cavalrymen. 
An eyewitness drawing has inspired an unofficial warning to plain soldiers. Save the last bullet for yourself. Harper's Weekly, March 23rd, 1867. The following summer, 40 black cavalrymen from Fort Hayes, Kansas, engaged over 800 Cheyenne Indians. Heroically, they fought them off. Such battles inspired the Plains Indians to call the cavalrymen Buffalo Soldiers. The Indians call them Buffalo Soldiers because their woolly heads are so much like the matted cushion that is between the horns of the buffalo. The officers say that the Negroes make good soldiers and fight like fiends. Army wife, Frances Rowe. The Buffalo Soldiers surveyed vast areas of the Southwest strung hundreds of miles of telegraph lines, and built and repaired frontier outposts. As Native Americans watched their tribal lands disappear, warriors fought desperately to preserve their way of life. It is bad to live to be old. Better to die young, fighting bravely in battle. Native American warrior chant. Often, when Native Americans encountered Buffalo soldiers, the fights were fearsome. Private John Randall, 10th Cavalry, was attacked in company of two civilians by a band of Cheyenne Indians numbering 60 or 70. In the fight which ensued, the two citizens were killed, one of whom was scalped. Private Randall was shot in the hip and given 11 lance thrusts to his shoulders and back. So effective had been the fire from Randall and his friend that the savages, weary of losing so many of their number, disappeared, leaving 13 braves dead. Regimental Reminiscences, 10th Cavalry. During the Indian Wars, the Buffalo soldiers would receive 18 medals of honor. Corporal Clinton Greaves was among the recipients. Corporal Clinton Greaves fought like a cornered lion. He fired his carbine until it was empty, and then, swinging it like a club, he bashed a gap through the swarming Apaches, permitting his companions to break free. Charles Hanna, Medal of Honor Historical Society. As the Buffalo soldiers were taming the West, back East, in June of 1877, Henry O. Flipper, an ex-slave from Georgia, became the first black man to graduate from West Point. He had arrived a semi-celebrity, having refused a $5,000 offer from a white man to have his son take his place. If I cannot endure prejudice and persecutions, even if they are offered, then I don't deserve the cadetship, and much less the commission of an army officer, Lieutenant Henry O. Flipper. Flipper was a hero to black Americans, and his graduation was reported by the New York Times. When Mr. Flipper, the colored cadet, stepped forward and received the reward of four years of hard work and unflinching courage, the crowd of spectators gave him a round of applause. General Sherman himself led the ovation when Flipper received his diploma. Lieutenant Flipper was eventually assigned quartermaster duties at Fort Davis, Texas. When he discovered that commissary funds were missing, he was afraid to report the theft and repaid the money out of his own pocket. The loss was eventually discovered, and Lieutenant Flipper was arrested and court-martialed. His attorney was Major Merritt Baber. The question before you is whether it is possible for a colored man to secure and hold a position as an officer of the army. The answer was no. In December of 1881, 25-year-old Lieutenant Flipper was found innocent of embezzlement, but guilty of conduct unbecoming an officer and gentleman. He was dishonorably discharged and would later write, Never did a man walk the path of uprightness straighter than I did but the trap was cunningly laid, and I was sacrificed. Henry O. Flipper. That same year, 
Tennessee began to dismantle the great principles of Reconstruction and passed the first so-called Jim Crow laws, which segregated the state's railroad cars. When Ida B. Wells was forcibly removed from a train after refusing to give up her seat to a white man, she sued the railroad and lost. That week, she wrote in her diary, I had firmly believed all along that the law was on our side and would, when appealed to, give us justice. I feel shorn of that belief and utterly discouraged. Oh, God, is there no redress, no peace, no justice in this land for us? Journalist and civil rights activist, Ida B. Wells. Across the South, states began enacting laws which segregated mass transportation and restricted black access to public accommodations and schools. In 1896, the Supreme Court in Plessy versus Ferguson ruled that racially separate facilities, if equal, did not violate the Constitution. Segregation, the court said, was not discrimination. The object of the 14th Amendment was undoubtedly to enforce the absolute equality of the two races before the law. But in the nature of things, it could not have been intended to abolish distinctions based on color. The United States Supreme Court. Two years later, the USS Maine blew up in Havana Harbor. 266 sailors and marines, including 22 Negroes, were killed. Enraged Americans, both black and white, blamed the Spanish and cried out, remember the Maine. There is no people on earth more loyal and devoted to their country than the Negro. I believe in the doctrine of peace taught by the lowly Nazarene, but one must have liberty before abiding peace can come. Force saved the Union kept the stars in the flag and made Negroes free. The time for God's force has come to free Cuba and avenge the Maine. Buffalo soldier Horace W. Bivens. On May 1st, 1898, fighting broke out in the Philippines. Minor skirmishes were fought in Puerto Rico, but the brunt of the war would play itself out in Cuba. The colored men of America have immense interest at stake. As a citizen and patriot, let him make common cause with the people and again prove himself an element of strength and power in vindicating the honor and claims of his country in the hour of the nation's peril. If die we must, let us die defending a just cause. Cleveland Gazette. Ultimately, it was Colonel Theodore Roosevelt's Rough Riders that captured the public's imagination. However, much of their glory, as well as their lives, were owed to the Buffalo soldiers of the 9th and 10th Cavalry. If it had not been for the Negro Cavalry, the Rough Riders would have been exterminated. I am not a Negro lover. My father fought with Mosby's Rangers, and I was born in the South. But the Negroes saved that fight. Washington Post. The charge up San Juan Ridge made the Buffalo Soldiers national heroes. All honor to the black troopers of the gallant 10th. No more striking example of bravery and coolness has been shown since the destruction of the Maine than by the colored veterans of the 10th Cavalry during the attack upon San Juan. Firing as they marched, their aim was splendid, their coolness was superb and their courage aroused the admiration of their comrades. Their advance was greeted with wild cheers from the white regiments, and with answering shouts, they pressed onward over the trenches they had taken close in pursuit of the retreating enemy. The war has not shown greater heroism. The men whose own freedom was baptized in blood have proved themselves capable of giving up their lives that others may be free. New York Mail and Express.
When the war was over, the Buffalo soldiers returned home to a country wallowing in racism. Shortly after Theodore Roosevelt assumed the presidency, he invited civil rights leader Booker T. Washington to a White House dinner. The response by segregationists was swift. The most damnable outrage which has ever been perpetrated by any citizen of the United States was committed yesterday by the president when he invited a nigger to dine with him at the White House, the Memphis Scimitar. W.E.B. Du Bois, the first African-American to receive a PhD from Harvard University, demanded equality. We claim for ourselves every single right that belongs to a freeborn American, political, civil, and social. And until we get these rights, we will never cease to protest and assail the ears of America. W.B. Du Bois. In August of 1906, a black soldier in Brownsville, Texas, was accused of pulling a white woman's hair. The allegation led to a violent late-night confrontation. When it was over, a white man was dead and another was wounded. An investigation was launched, and despite evidence of a frame-up, the army accepted the statements of the mayor and the white citizens of Brownsville that black soldiers had fired the shots. President Roosevelt ordered that 167 black troops, including Medal of Honor recipients and veterans of the charge up San Juan Hill, be stripped of their military benefits and discharged without honor. Whatever may be the value of Negro troops in time of war, the fact remains that they are a curse to the country in time of peace. The New Orleans Times Picayune. Within six weeks of the 1914 assassination of Hungary's Archduke Ferdinand, most of Europe was at war. America managed to stay out of it until 1917, when President Woodrow Wilson said, the world must be made safe for democracy. Once again, African Americans were among the first to volunteer. I am eager for the fray. Death does not matter but it will mean life for thousands of my countrymen or for my race, for right must triumph. I'm not apprehensive of the future of my people in the States, for the free allied nations of the world will not condone America's past treatment of her colored citizens. Lieutenant Osceola McCain, 367th Infantry. When the United States joined the fight against Germany, the French army was on the verge of disintegration. Most African-American civic leaders saw the conflict as an opportunity for Negroes to once again demonstrate their commitment to the noble principle of liberty. Let us, while the war lasts, forget our special grievances and close ranks shoulder to shoulder with our white fellow citizens fighting for democracy. We make no ordinary sacrifice, but we make it gladly and willingly. W.E.B. Du Bois. There were those in Washington, however, who adamantly opposed Negro enlistment. I condemn any mobilization plan that would result in arrogant, strutting representatives of black soldiery in every community. Senator James Vardaman. As in the past, desperate times called for desperate measures. President Wilson ordered the enlistment of all able-bodied men, black or white. Everywhere, the offensive spirit is alive, pulsating, waiting for the hour to strike, that the spirit of real and true democracy will not perish. I should be happy to have millions of colored soldiers over here fighting to preserve the highest valued thing on earth, liberty. Lieutenant Osceola McCain, 
367th Infantry. Among the first United States troops to arrive in France were several hundred black stevedores. Within a year and a half, there would be 50,000 African-American soldiers toiling under the French sun, most of them assigned to labor details known as slave battalions. The men often worked in 24-hour shifts under grueling conditions, proud that they had once loaded a record 1,200 tons of flour in just nine and one half hours. America's black press was quick to point out that the soldiers were the muscle behind the Allied war effort in Europe. The work of colored stevedores may be menial, but it is as essential as the manning of the guns at the front. The fact is that without these stevedores, first unloading and aiding in transporting the guns, munitions, and supplies to the front, there would be no manning of guns at the front. Reporter Ralph W. The first all-black fighting unit to arrive in France was New York's 369th Infantry. The commander of the American Expeditionary Forces, General John Blackjack Pershing, bowed to political pressure back home and refused to use the men in combat. He assigned the 369th to the French High Command, who dubbed them Les Enfants Perdus, the Lost Children. The unit's white commander, Colonel William Hayward, would later write, We are Les Enfants Perdus, and glad of it. Our great American general simply put the black orphan in a basket, set it on the doorstep of the French, pulled the bell, and went away. I said this to a French colonel, and he said, Welcome, little black baby. Colonel William Hayward. The French army adopted the men as their own. We were fully equipped with French rifles and French helmets. Our wagons, our rations, our machine guns, and everything pertaining to the equipment of the regiment for trench warfare was supplied by the French army. Second Lieutenant Noble Sissel. In a letter to his brother back in Harlem, Sergeant Hannibal Davis bragged about his new gear. I myself, have got an automatic rifle which shoots two shots per second and have named it Joan of Arc, Sergeant Hannibal Davis. General Pershing, concerned that such treatment might spoil the black soldiers, issued a directive to his French counterparts. It is important for French officers who have been called upon to exercise command over black American troops to have an exact idea of the position occupied by Negroes in the United States. Although a citizen in the United States, the black man is regarded by the white American as an inferior being with whom relations of business or service only are possible. You must not eat with them, must not shake hands or seek to talk or meet with them outside the requirements of military service. General John Pershing. The 369th Infantry would come to be known as the Harlem Hellfighters. Their motto was, God damn, let's go. Years later, a soldier whose name has been lost to history recounted his march to the front. There were a whole lot of blind men and one-legged men and one-armed men and sick men all coming this way. I asked the white men where all these wounded men come from, and he says, nigga, they're coming right from where you're going the day after tomorrow. In Minnecourt, France, the officers and men of the 369th came face to face with the horrors of war. Major Warner Ross would later describe such an encounter. Stones, dirt, shrapnel, limbs and whole trees filled the air. The noise and concussion alone were enough to kill you. Flashes of fire. 
metallic crack of high explosives. The awful explosions that dug holes 15 and 20 feet in diameter. The utter and complete pandemonium and the stench of hell. Your friends blown to bits, the pieces dropping near you. Major Warner Ross. On the night of May 14, 1918, Privates Henry Johnson and Needham Roberts were standing watch when a grenade landed in their trench. Private Needham was badly wounded and Henry Johnson was left to face a German patrol on his own. One of the unit's white officers, Major Arthur Little, would later tell his story. The little soldier from Albany came down like a wildcat upon the shoulders of the German. As Johnson sprang, he unsheathed his bolo knife, and as his knife landed upon the shoulders of that ill-fated Bosch, the blade of the knife was buried to the hilt through the crown of the German's head. Major Arthur Little, 369th Infantry Division. In fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat, the former Red Cap Porter of the New York Central Railroad single-handedly wounded or killed 24 enemy soldiers. Back in America, the story was front page news. The press called the incident the Battle of Henry Johnson. Having shot one of his foe down and clubbed another with the butt of his rifle, he sprang to the aid of Roberts with his bolo knife. As the enemy fell into disorderly retreat, Johnson, three times wounded, sank to the ground, seized a grenade alongside his prostrate body, and literally blew one of the fleeing Germans to fragments. Martin Green, the New York Evening World. Two days later, the men were presented with the French Medal of Honor, the Croix de Guerre. They were the first American soldiers, black or white, to be so honored in World War I. When asked about the event, Henry Johnson said, There isn't so much to tell. Just fought for my life. A rabbit would have done that. Private Henry Johnson. The Harlem Hellfighters spent 191 days in frontline trenches, more than any other American unit. There was often nothing between the German army and Paris but these black volunteers from New York. During that time, they never had any men captured nor any ground taken. At the Battle of Belleau Wood, a French general ordered the soldiers to retreat. Their commanding officer refused. Turn back? I should say not. My men never retire. They go forward or they die. Colonel William Hayward. At Meuse Argonne, the 369th ran headfirst into a hailstorm of hand grenades and machine gun fire. In four weeks of relentless combat, the troops suffered 851 casualties. Sergeant Clinton Peterson was shocked by the carnage. I never shall forget those fields covered with their silent, motionless figures clad in the khaki of the United States. The horizon blue of France and the field gray of the Germans. Many of those bodies lay for 10 days in the hot sun before the pioneers, sappers, and bombers came along to bury them. Sergeant Clinton Peterson. The battlefields of World War I were a no-man's land of barbed wire and poison gas. The weapons of choice were mortars filled with scrap metal, flamethrowers, machine guns, and bayonets. Days before his death, a French officer, Alfred Joubert, wrote in his diary, Humanity is mad. It must be mad to do what it is doing. Hell cannot be so terrible. In France, hell was known as Verdun. The city had been the scene of a 10-month struggle, the object of which was not to gain ground, but to kill as many of the enemy as possible. The fighting had taken over 250,000 lives, 100,000 were missing, and 300,000 had been gassed or wounded on both sides. Verdun was the destination of Eugene Jacques Dullard a black American expatriate who enlisted in the French military in 1914. 
It was clear we were heading for hell. Men and beasts were hanging from the branches of trees. I thought I had seen fighting in other battles, but no one has ever seen anything like that had done. Not ever before, or ever since. Eugene Jacques Bullard. In the skies above Verdun, the Germans employed a deadly new weapon, the airplane. It was all bad, but the worst came when the German airplanes flew low and sprayed us with liquid fire. I was wounded, but believe me, when I saw that coming, I sure did some lively hopping around. There wasn't going to be any broiled Washington if I could help it. But some of the wounded were burned to death. Those Huns should be made to pay for that sort of thing. It ain't fighting. It's concentrated hell. Frank Washington, 371st Regiment, Company B. Most American military leaders thought that Negroes were incapable of learning to fly. Eugene Bullard proved them wrong when he earned his wings in the French Flying Corps. He was the world's first African-American fighter pilot, and he called himself the Black Swallow of Death. I was determined to do all that was in my power to make good. As I knew, the eyes of the world were watching me as the first Negro military pilot. Bullard's plane was painted with a heart pierced by an arrow and the motto, All Blood Runs Red. With his mascot, Jimmy the Monkey, tucked inside his jacket, Bullard patrolled the skies above France in search of German aircraft. In the distance, we spotted four big German bomber planes with 16 German fighter planes to protect them. I started shooting at every damn enemy plane that I even thought might be hitting in my direction. All I could see were burning planes earthbound and a long trail of smoke coming from one of the bombers, which exploded in the air. Eugene Bullitt's service in the Air Corps was brief. After shooting down a member of the Red Baron's Flying Circus, he was dismissed from the service aeronautique for striking a white officer. The daring pilot nevertheless continued to fight for France as a foot soldier. I have served France as best I could. France taught me the true meaning of liberty, equality, and fraternity. My services to France can never repay all that I owe to her. Eugene Jacques Bullard. In September of 1918, America's black soldiers joined in the Allies' last great push, the Champagne Offensive. It is a beautiful sight on a clear night when the big guns are in action. One is reminded of a 4th of July celebration. They annoyed us very much for a while. But now we are lost when we don't hear them. Sergeant William Shepard. The incessant shelling turned the French countryside into fields of death. In the mornings, most of the valleys we went through were full of gas and smoke from the exploding shells. The sickly sweet odor still smites my nostrils with little effort of imagination. The air then was tinged a deep grayish blue, and from the top of the hill, you could barely distinguish the men moving through the haze below. Inhaling these fumes and noxious gases no doubt contributed to our inordinate capacity for deepest slumber. Sergeant Hannibal Davis. Like all soldiers in all wars, when the men slept, they dreamed of home. I could see it right in front of me. I wonder if I will see it again. Then I thought of a letter. If I could only pull a letter from one of my pockets that came from home, how happy I would be. But could I do it? No, for I had not seen a letter for some time. How I longed for word from home. Corporal Horace Pippin. 
On a gray September morning, Frank Washington, a volunteer from the Black 371st Infantry Regiment, was ordered over the top. He later told of his slow crawl across the battlefield. My platoon found itself under the fire of three machine guns. One of these guns was in front and running like a mill race. The other two kept piling into us from the flanks. The losses were mounting and I was wounded. Ordinary bullets are bad enough, but the one that hit me was an explosive bullet. I lay right down and had a heart to heart with St. Peter. I never expected to get home again. Frank Washington. The German machine guns inflicted terrible losses. We came to the edge of a swamp when the enemy machine guns opened fire. It was so bad that out of 58 of us who went into a particular strip, only eight came out without being killed or wounded. Corporal Elmer Earl. As the sun rose the morning of September 28th, Corporal Freddy Stowers received word that a German patrol wished to surrender. Years later, an American president would recall the events of that day. Only a few minutes after the firing began, the enemy troops climbed out of their trenches, held up their arms, and seemed to surrender. The American forces held their fire and stepped out into the open. As our troops moved forward, the enemy jumped back into their trenches and sprayed our men with a vicious stream of machine gun and mortar fire. The assault annihilated well over 50% of Company C. In the midst of this bloody chaos, Corporal Stowers took charge and bravely led his men forward, destroying their foes. Although he was mortally wounded during the attack, Freddie Stowers continued to press forward, urging his men on until he died. For his valor, Corporal Freddie Stowers would become the only black veteran of World War I to receive the Medal of Honor. Sadly, it took 73 years for his actions that day to be officially recognized. We want to honor a true hero, a man who makes us proud of our heritage as Americans, a man who in life and death helped keep America free, and who fought not for glory, but for a cause larger than himself, the cause of liberty. President George H.W. Bush. As the last battle of the Great War, the drive on Mets played out. New York's Harlem Hellfighters became the first to reach the nearest point to the city. In doing so, it was colored troops who could lay claim to having reached the point farthest east and nearest to the Rhine. I was on the front when the drive began in this last battle of the war to establish world democracy, a thing the colored soldiers and their kinsmen back home crave. As I retraced my steps over the awful fields of carnage and saw the lifeless, blood-bespattered bodies of colored soldiers lying on the dark and bloody field, the natural feelings of anguish was made endurable only by the thought that our colored soldiers were in it to the end. They fought like heroes and died like martyrs. And then there was radiant hope that they did not fall in vain. Journalist Ralph W. Tyler. Some 20 million people died in the war to end all wars, including 113,000 American soldiers. At the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in the year 1918, it was over. We'll meet again, don't know where, don't 
don't know when. One of the most inspiring scenes I ever witnessed was today, about 11.05 a.m. Some sunny the regimental band played Marseille, the Star Spangled Banner, and God Save the King. Keep smiling. As soon as the last note was sounded, Just hilarious like cheers by both soldiers and civilians were almost do. deafening. Till Old men jumped and threw up their hats. The Women dark. whose hearts were heavy from the strain of a Far relentless away. war waved their aprons in joy. The street was filled and with a solid, slow-moving, seething mass of humanity. The folks that I know. It appeared to me that the brotherhood of the trenches was heralding the brotherhood of men. And they'll be happy to Sergeant William J. Huntley, 372nd Infantry. As the men prepared to return to America, French General Mariano Goybe expressed the gratitude of his thankful nation. I respectfully salute our glorious comrades who have fallen, and I bow to your colors, for they have shown us the way to victory. Dear friends from America, remember your general who is proud of having commanded you, and be sure of his grateful affection to you all forever. General Mariano Goybe. When the Harlem Hellfighters came home, more than one million people cheered as they marched up Fifth Avenue to a hero's welcome. It was the greatest black American celebration since emancipation. Every bayonet was shining just like the highest polished steel. Every rifle was dustless as though it had been resting in an airtight case. Trousers were creased, coats pressed, and helmets shined as though they had never been covered with the white clay of the Champagne Mountains. Second Lieutenant, Noble Sissel. One of the Harlem Hellfighters' white officers, Major Arthur Little, would later write, During the entire progress of that seven-mile march, I scarcely heard 10 consecutive bars of music. So great were the roars of cheers, the applause, and the shouts of personal greeting. On the 17th of February, 1919, New York City knew no color line. Not all of the black soldiers were so fortunate. Many were left behind in France to clean up the war debris and rebury the dead. Men of the 92nd, a black combat division that had lost some 1,500 of its members, shoveled coal aboard the USS Virginia. When the job was finished, the soldiers began to load their gear aboard the battleship for the voyage home. The ship's executive officer, Commander Max Frucht, refused to let them board. No black soldier has ever embarked on an American battleship, and no one ever will. Outraged, Private William Hewlett wrote to W.E.B. Du Bois. We regret that on October 1919, we will sail for our home in Petersburg, Virginia, where true democracy is enjoyed only by the white people. Why did black men die here in France, 3,300 miles from their home? Was it to make democracy safe for the white people in America, for the black race left out? William Hewlett. During the summer of 1919, anti-black race riots erupted in cities all across the nation. 76 African Americans were lynched. 14 were burned at the stake. 10 of the victims were soldiers, and some of them were still in uniform. from fighting, but by the God of heaven, we are cowards and jackasses if now that the war is over, we do not marshal every ounce of our brain and brawn to fight a sterner, 
longer, more unbending battle against the forces of hell in our own land. W.E.B. Du Bois. In September of 1939, Germany invaded Poland and Japan was at war with China. President Franklin Roosevelt began preparing the United States to join the conflict. And black Americans realized that once again they would be going to war. This time, they were determined that it would be different. We sincerely hope to discourage any other colored boys who might have plans to join the Navy and make the same mistake we did. All they would become is seagoing bellhops, chambermaids, and dishwashers. We take it upon ourselves to write this letter regardless of any action the Navy authorities may take. We know that it could not possibly surpass the mental cruelty inflicted upon us on this ship. An open letter to the Pittsburgh Courier. One of the first American heroes of World War II was black. On December 7, 1941, at Pearl Harbor, Dory Miller was a messman aboard the USS West Virginia. When the Japanese attacked, he came to the aid of the ship's mortally wounded captain, then used an anti-aircraft gun to shoot down a number of enemy fighters. Miller had never been taught to fire the weapon as it was against Navy regulations for blacks to do so. Only when the ammunition was exhausted and the battleship was sinking beneath him did he leave his post. When asked about his actions that day, he replied, It wasn't her heart. I just pulled the trigger and she worked fine. Dory Miller. Dory would become the first black sailor to receive the Navy Cross. After Admiral Chester Nimitz pinned the medal on his chest, poet Langston Hughes declared, when Dory Miller took gun in hand, Jim Crow started his last stand. Our battle is far from won, but when it is, Jim Crow will be done. Poet Langston Hughes. Dory Miller's distinguished devotion to duty, extraordinary courage, and disregard for his own safety earned him the admiration of black Americans nationwide. He was also awarded a promotion the Navy elevated him from mess attendant second class to mess attendant first class. The black press was outraged. Is it fair, honest, or sensible that this country, with its fate in the balance, should continue to bar Negroes from service except in the mess department of the Navy, when at first sign of dangers, they so dramatically show their willingness to face death in the defense of the stars and stripes. In the months before Pearl Harbor, the War Department, at the urging of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, agreed to establish African-American personnel in each major branch of the United States military. There was, however, a catch. Virtually all the units were strictly segregated. The policy of the War Department is not to intermingle colored and white enlisted personnel in the same regimental organizations. This policy has proved satisfactory over a long period of years, and to make changes now would be destructive to morale. The War Department. During the course of World War II, roughly 1,200,000 African American men and women would serve the cause of liberty. The issue is plain. The issue simply is freedom. Freedom is a precious thing. Journalist Jay Sanders read it. In the early days of the war, the United States government assigned most black American troops to service details. There, they were often subjected to intense racial discrimination. Here on the post, we are treated like dogs. 
Even in Eden times, we are told to remain at attention outside the mess hall until the whites have finished eating. Then we go and eat what's left over, food which is cold, tasteless, and even sometimes dirty. Why can't we eat, live, and be respected as the whites? That is all we ask, a chance to prove to the whole world that we colored people are no one's fools. Just give us a chance to show our color. 938th Quartermaster Platoon, Fort Logan, Colorado. In Pennsylvania, the Pittsburgh Courier said enough. The newspaper launched the Double V campaign. Its motto was victory at home and victory abroad. We as colored Americans are determined to protect our country, our form of government, and the freedoms which we cherish for ourselves and the rest of the world. Therefore, we have adopted the double V war cry. Thus, in our fight for freedom, we wage a two-pronged attack against our enslavers at home and those abroad who would enslave us. We have a stake in this fight. We are Americans too. The Pittsburgh Courier. In June of 1942, the United States Marine Corps began admitting black recruits for the first time since the American Revolution. Their men received their training at a segregated camp in Montfort Point, North Carolina. They never forgot the welcome bestowed upon them by their racist drill instructor, Sergeant Germany. The Marine Corps is not for cooks and janitors which is about all you son of a bitch people are qualified to do as far as I can see. Just remember that I am going to try and get as much out of you people as I would from a platoon of white recruits. If I have to kill you to do it, then you are dead. My name is Sergeant Germany, and I'm a redneck peckerwood. Of the more than 19,000 African-American Marines who passed through Montford Point during World War II, Almost 13,000 were assigned to overseas defense battalions or combat support companies. Many of the units were directly on the line of fire. The men were often clearing a jungle one moment, then fighting for their lives the next. I watched those Negro boys carefully. They were under intense mortar and artillery fire, as well as rifle and machine gun fire. They all kept on advancing until the counterattack was stopped. Lieutenant Joe Grimes, United States Marine Corps. Private Kenneth J. Tibbs would become the first Montfort Point Marine to die in action when he fell on the beach at Saipan. The national press took note. Negro Marines under fire for the first time have rated a universal 4-0 on Saipan. Time Magazine. Marine Commandant General Alexander Vandegrift was even more succinct. The Negro Marines are no longer on trial. They are Marines, period. General Alexander Vandegrift. Black Americans began serving their country in revolutionary new ways. When the military activated the 555th Parachute Infantry Battalion, the Triple Nickels, the men were trained for a secret mission, codenamed Operation Firefly. Their highly classified job was to protect America's west coast from Japanese balloon bombs, which had been designed to ignite firestorms in coastal forests and cities. The 555th approached Operation Firefly committed to absolute secrecy. We realized that any slip on our part, any breach of security, could bring chaos to the West Coast and damage the nation's morale. In this mission, and in many others, we were successful. Lieutenant Colonel, Bradley Biggs. The United States Army was the first of the military services to open its doors to black women. The 800 WACs of the Army's Central Postal Directory Battalion, the 6888, were stationed overseas 
and in charge of redirecting all V-mail for Europe. Major Charity Adams was the battalion's commanding officer. Their motto was, no mail, low morale. Every move we made was watched and recorded. We were the ambitious, the patriotic, the adventurous. We were whomever our environment had made us, and that was what we had to contribute to the wax. Major Charity Adams. Did he suffer beneath the 